Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this will be a slide-free speech, if you can believe that. Hello, over there. If you would like to continue conversing, you can take it outside. Thank you. Okay, so this will be a slide-free speech, our final one for the evening, even though our schedule claims one more, because we, um, hey, Matthias, Ma hey, Matthias, 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 thank you. If you have more questions, can you take them over there? Just because we're going to let the, our, new, our next guy talk. <laughs> this is what happens after four days in DEF CON. I get a little aggressive. You know, I've been here since last Friday because of Black Hat. I don't know. I mean, if you like Vegas, this may be your thing, but I do not. I am not a Vegas person. I am not. I would not come here if it were not for this conference in Black Hat and Michelle making me come here. But I wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Okay. Now let's talk about our slide free last speech of the night. This is Dr. Stephen Zaney. He's a PhD in, in, and man, I wrote this and now I can't read it. Comparative literature. Thank you. I actually could read my own writing. And a master's in philosophy in French. Actually, I didn't even know you can get a master's in French. Besides being French, I figured that would be a master. So this was new for me when I read that. He currently works as the faculty development director for Lamar University. And he's giving a talk to us on how to unwork your job, revolution, radicals, and employment by committee, right? Yeah, yeah okay. So help me in um, welcoming Stephen, Dr. Stephen Zaney. One of the uh, things that you always hope when you're presenting after a long day is that uh, everybody that comes before you sucks. <laughs> and uh, so damn you, Chris, for uh, not having that happen. Like, this is my first DEF CON, and, uh, and it's kind of crazy, actually. <laughs> like, I don't know. I've been, it's like getting just hit all the time with sort of new stuff everywhere and uh, learning things and... Uh, I don't really like that, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but good, good. Uh, what the thing? The thing is, uh, the this topic, uh, which I'll get to eventually, is about unworking your job and about going to your job and about the kind of things you can do at work that aren't really work. Um, but really, the topic about this is, I, I actually want to think and talk about what social engineering is on some level. And I'm kind of an outsider, right? I mean, I'm just this. Uh, 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 academic uh, to some degree. Uh, you know, I don't really do code. Uh, but uh, that's the great thing about DEF CON. It's this sort of conglomeration of a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of different spaces just sort of throwing things at each other. And, uh, and so I, I've, I'm going to throw a bunch of stuff at you and then take a little bit of time to get there. And um, the starting off point for this, though, might uh, uh, have just erupted spontaneously for me uh, riding around in the last couple of days. The, I was in a cab uh, coming here, actually, not today, but uh, the cabbie asked, you know, he just does that sort of conversational bit of, are you here in Vegas, business or pleasure? And, then, and you know, I mentioned, like, well, it's a bit of both, right? I mean, I'm actually giving this presentation at DEF CON. And that just immediately led to him go like, ah, oh, so are you a hacker or a defender? And, uh, and, you know, the funny thing about this for me is that, like, man, you're just social engineering me, actually, right? Like, he doesn't give a crap, one. Uh, but two, he's set, right? Like, I mean, this is debate 101. Like, if I say I'm a hacker, he's going to do some kind of like, oh, man, yeah, hackers, that's cool. Yeah. But if I'm a defender, then, uh, yeah, it's, it's save the man. Right? Like, he just wants to bond with me so that he gets a better tip. Right? Like, that's it. He's just, that's the only thing that's working there. And that is one of the sort of elements about what social engineering is, but it actually leads me, like, to this sort of larger picture. Because, uh, uh, like, the way to put this for me is that social engineering is not, and, and this is the bit, like, it is not about doing the right thing. This is an odd thing to say. It's about changing people's minds about what the right thing is. 
Right. You're engineering society in some sense, and you can do that on a really small scale or on a large scale or on a middle scale, and then those, that's the three things I'm going to talk about here. But that's the way I want to frame this for you. Like the, the question to really ask is what is it that we do when we do social engineering, and right, what's, what's our purpose of all this? So let me start off with a sort of big picture social engineering for you, and I'll do this from a kind of literature perspective, right, because that's where I'm coming from. Um, back in the 17th century, 1774, the very first real essay on genius came out. A guy named Girard, Alexander Girard, essay on genius. He ma starts making this argument about geniuses, and no one had done this in print before. Like, if, it, basically, in the 14th century, if you talked about geniuses, it really just meant some smart guy, right? But it didn't really have any kind of definition to it at all. And usually, it was uh, inspiration. Like, if you're smart, it's because you got it from the gods, you got it from some other source, uh, usually divinely inspired. All the epics start this way. Like, the qualities of an epic are they have to be divinely inspired. So that's just what a genius is. It's just some guy who gets information from somewhere. And that's, in fact, um, the sort of piece of it. But uh, Gerard starts saying, oh, no, that's not what genius is. Um, in fact, genius has to have natural rather than cultural implications. Like, it comes from nature somehow. And it's not something that you would learn in school. Like, a, if, you've, if you're just saying stuff that you learned in school, it doesn't mean anything, right? A genius has to be somebody who comes out of left field somewhere. And what the, happens with that is it starts getting these tags on it after Girard about how it has to be both natural but somehow degenerate, right? Like, there's, you're not cultural. Something's wrong with you if you're a genius. And, and I want you to think about this particularly because you believe this even though if you were, like, around 600 years ago, you wouldn't have. But people like Girard sort of won the argument, and they social engineered everyone. And that's why Einstein has crazy hair, all right? You, every time you see Einstein, crazy hair, right? Einstein didn't have crazy hair all the time. There are plenty of pictures of Einstein without crazy hair. But we like this image of him because it's a projection of him being somehow strange and unusual. Um, one of the connections for this is uh, uh, Byron. I like to bring up Byron because I had, a, I had done a bunch of work on him. But Byron had a club foot, so he's a degenerate, right? Uh, he's bisexual. They didn't figure that out until 1955, but he's a degenerate, right? Like, but that's one of those things that they would sort of kick around as an idea all the time. If you're a genius, there must be something kind of strangely wrong with you. And again, that's social engineering because nobody thought it in the 14th century, in the 12th century, right? This is an idea that had to kind of get pushed around. And like the other way to put this is very specifically before Genius came out, 1774, in 1759, Edward Young had an essay, Conjectures on Original Composition. Um, and let me read you a couple things uh, from this, which is just boring as hell for you, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> An original, this is all about works of art, right? Or writing or whatever. Original works of art. An original may be said to be of a vegetable nature, right? It's natural. Um, it rises spontaneously from the vital roots of genius. It grows. It is not made. It is, imitations are all a sort of manufacture wrought up by mechanics, art, and labor, right? It's not natural, right? Okay, we might as well grow food by another's virtue or fat by another's food uh, as famous by another's thoughts. The world will pay its debt of praise but once, and instead of applauding, it will explode a second demand as a cheat. Uh, copies surpass not their originals as streams rise not higher than their spring. The meddling ape imitation, monkeys are masters of mimicry. All right, so the whole argument that this guy starts making, 18th century, is things need to be original. And I know you might be thinking, well, <laughs> no duh, right? But the point is, prior to this 18th century, you weren't supposed to be original. There was no plagiarism. This is really sort of an interesting sort of piece. There's just no plagiarism. You would be expected, in, a, in effect, to take other people's stuff. And I, mean, I can sort of give you the proof of this. Like Shakespeare's uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet is a sort of pyramid. It's a classical narrative that he repeats and uses over and over again. Like, he, of course, he's original, right? But he's, he's reusing old material. You were supposed to reuse old material. The idea prior to a certain point was, of course, you don't just do your own thing because in the classical era, things were better and you want to return to that. Well, 
not a surprise, but again, what I want to say is this is social engineering, that right around, right, mid-18th century is when people start saying things need to be original, and that's when the first patent and copyright laws really start coming into effect in England and France and most of Europe, because that's when you start making money doing this thing. Right? So what a surprise that you get someone making an argument for originality and then you get people making money off of being original. You can't make money off of doing something if it's not your work. Right? These are conjoined ideas that sort of come around. Society changed its attitudes about what they thought about what was supposed to be artistic, creative work in this era, and they did it because of these social engineers, right? People who started publishing and making certain sets of arguments. Now that's large scale. I kind of want to switch up a little uh, to do something smaller though, uh, briefly. And, and by the way, this is engineering of another sort, which is uh, one of the uh, things going on in academia these now, cognitive development. They've learned that if you go more than like 15, 20 minutes on a speech and you just sort of keep going, you lose the audience. They just totally bomb out. They don't retain anything. So you have to like make these pauses at a certain point. <laughs> So I'm going to switch topics entirely, right? Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to switch topics. Um, uh, and let's talk about one of the more, uh, if, if, frankly, I think if I have anything interesting to say, it's right about here. Uh, jump, jump forward 200 years. In the 60s, there was a radical lesbian feminist. <laughs> Uh, separatist feminist named Valerie Solanas. Uh, some of you may have heard of Valerie Solanas. She's fantastic. Uh, just fantastic as far as insane lesbian separatists go. Um, but there's been a movie about her. I, uh, I shot Andy Warhol because literally she shot Andy Warhol. Um, uh, Solanas was this, you know, this is the 60s. Uh, feminism is really sort of getting its strong uh, foothold. Uh, second wave feminism going on. There's all sorts of stuff. New York, there's this clique of artists. Andy Warhol is, is just this kind of uh, guru of. Uh, Solanas shows up. She wants... Uh, and she's a radical lesbian feminist, and they're like, yeah, come hang out. Right? Uh, just literally sort of trying to create this eclectic group of people. She's got a play she wants them to uh, help her produce called Up Your Ass. Uh, radical lesbian feminist. And, and see, and uh, what Warhol does is, you know, like takes the play and it's like, yeah, great, we'll read it. And then, uh, and by the way, I, the film's actually pretty good. The, the Lily Thompson, it's got some nice people in it. Um, uh, so I, I you know, recommend it. It's kind of fun. It's a depressing uh, uh, film. But like basically they take the thing and then they're, they just sort of ignore it, right? Like because she's just kind of a nut. And, um, and what happens is she keeps sort of pushing them like, hey, what are you doing with the play? Uh, you're stealing it. What are you? Right? And it turns into this conflict. She sort of freaks out, eventually loses it, um, and uh, comes in with a gun one day and starts shooting at people. Uh, she hits Warhol once, doesn't kill him, but um, you know, it's fairly devastating. It tries to kill a couple people. Um, uh, she gets taken away, diagnosed with schizophrenia, goes to, uh, basically sort of goes to jail for years. And by the way, that's, that's a little social engineering for you too, uh, the, right? Different perceptions of women at different times. You know, a woman shoots somebody, uh, she's crazy, right? It's not uh, manslaughter or harm. It's not aggression, it's craziness. Like that's just the kind of way we perceive things. Uh, she got out of jail, sort of faded into obscurity, died of pneumonia. Uh, the reason I... Br the reason I bring her up, though, and this is what sort of where I'm going with this, is um, that's the sort of, for me, an example of like failed social engineering, because she was trying to sort of get her message out, and she didn't do it. And besides, but, the, but, uh, but here's the trigger for this, but besides her play, Up Your Ass, uh, she had this really fascinating uh, manifesto called the Scum Manifesto. I, you must just go online. This thing is to just, just Google it. You'll find it immediately. Go on right and read the Scum Manifesto, Society for Cutting Up Men. That's the S-C-U-M. Um, it's radical lesbian feminist separatist. She, her idea is we need to kill all the men, uh, have a, a wonderful free world of femininity. Um, uh, I mean, I, uh, it's, some of it is just this kind of rant. Uh, I mean, a lot of it, frankly, is just this kind of rant. And you may be saying, how can you have, actually have a civilization with no men in it? Wouldn't you not be able to reproduce? But uh, whatever. She has this, oh, science is progressing. We'll take care of that. Uh, but, 
But here's, uh, here's the part that actually gets kind of interesting, and I'll, I'll read a little bit uh, uh, from this to you just because this is pretty fascinating, right? Um, here's how this would work. Um, scum, the people who take it, will become members of the unwork force, the fuck-up force. They will get jobs of various kinds and unwork. For example, sales girls will not charge for merchandise. Scum telephone operators will not charge for calls. Scum office and factory workers will secretly destroy equipment. Scum will unwork at a job until fired, then get a new job to unwork at. Now that's, that's actually pretty brilliant, right? Uh, and I kind of want to dwell on it because um, there's stuff going on there. And what I'll tell you is one of the ways I'd say it's brilliant is because I've watched it happen. Right? And this is actually the sort of thing I could say to you. Some of you will recognize this just pretty much in your own corporate setting, frankly. But like the very first time I ever saw it happen on some explicitly conscious uh, way is that I walked into the photocopier room once to make some copies and the thing was broken. Right? Like it was just jammed up. <sighs> So what do you do when the photocopier is jammed? Well, you either fix it yourself if you can, or if it's some error message code you don't know how to read, you don't care, uh, you just go down to the secretary, right? And you say, hey, copier's jammed. Well, the question to ask yourself is, why didn't the last person who jammed it do that? All right. Well, because they're doing unwork is the answer, right? Now, there's a lot of reasons. I don't know what the motivation is. There could be several. Uh, just pure aggression on their part, right, or some sort of uh, – it's hard to p p parse that out. But basically what you've got is someone who is – limiting the efficiency of the organization, oh, either out of laziness or aggression, or for some reason, but that's exactly what they're doing, right? They could, someone should have taken care of this problem before I ever got to it. Well, you can do that a thousand different ways. And that actually leads me to sort of where I'm really going with this with uh, some actual sort of more specific information, which is, um, hey, it turns out that uh, there, there are people who are much more sophisticated than Solanus who have worked at this issue. Um, and that is, there's a, uh, 1944 CIA document it's, uh, that's been declassified at this point. You can also just Google this thing immediately and grab a hold of it. Uh, not that long. Uh, a nice book has been written about it, Simple Sabotage by Robert Galford and Bob Frisch, uh, 2015. I also recommend you go take a look at this. It'll give you some things in depth. Um, but that document is... Uh, it wasn't the CIA at the time, OSS, right? CIA didn't exist. But it's a, it was a spy document given to espionage agents who were working overseas in different companies about how to conduct sabotage, but not normal sabotage like let's blow up the plant. Rather, let's stay in the plant and work there and kind of unwork the job, right? Now, and, and see, for spies, there are a lot of ways to do that. I think that you could sort of see are like physically really pretty easy to do. I mean, what you have to do is, uh, let's say you just loosen a couple of bolts here and there, and then it's not going to break immediately. It's going to break two months from now when you're not around, right? Um, that kind of thing. And so what you can do is you can really, I mean, if you did something extreme like blowing up the factory, that's a problem and it gets immediately solved and they address it. But if you just gum up the works a little bit here and there and you get somebody else to gum up the works here, then you cause some real damage that's permanent and long lasting and you work your way up the ladder, frankly, right? I mean, you can continue to cause more and more damage. Well, this was an actual CIA document that started getting used, right? But like literally the, the, the point to give you is this is actually how things can work in companies here. And what I want to say to you is sort of in a social engineering way, you have to recognize that this is, it's both a negative force that maybe you want to try to find ways to thwart, right? And that's a lot of what the book uh, Simple Sabotage is about. Like you're going to see this stuff happening, you could stop it. But frankly, you, there might be reasons for you to do it too. And, uh, and I kind of want to go through those, some with, with a couple of personal examples. And let me just... Um, let me just read a few things from the, the actual field manual, right? Insist on doing things through channels, right? Um, right? Insist on doing things through channels. So when some sort of project comes up, don't actually get it accomplished, right? Um, channel it somewhere. Make speeches. Talk as frequently as possible and at great length. Illustrate your points. 
when possible, refer matters to committees for further study and consideration. <laughs> Attempt to make committees as large as possible. <laughs> Never less than five, right? Really, like if you have a committee, once it goes over five, that thing is gold in terms of the kind of slowdown effect it has, right? Haggle over precise wordings of communication minutes. Refer back to matters decided last time and reopened them. <laughs> Avoid caution, right? Uh, uh, except when you need it for your own project. Be reasonable. Tell everyone to be reasonable. Slow down. All right. Now, I, I, now I just want to, like I said, I, there's a bunch more of these. I mean, there's just a bunch more. You should go take a look at this book, right? Uh, I mean, I just, it would just be tedious for me to walk through it all. But I'll give you just a couple of examples that are sort of personal, right? So one of these, and I want to mention the photocopier as a, as a, a, a great example. Like one of the sort of key elements of this is um, there's a certain kind of level of accountability that disappears. And that's what you're really working for here to do your unwork the best way. Like if the photocopier, you don't even have to break the photocopier, right? You just have to find it broken and not get it fixed. Right? That's the sort of way that works. You will find things screwed up in your organization already. You just have to not address them. And you will have people who are not really competent employees. You need to make sure they get working on the important projects. Right? <laughs> I'm like, right, you've got someone who's really efficient and knows how to do things, shuffle them off into the corner to do this useless thing that actually won't affect much change. Like these are the sort of projects, ways to do it. But you see the, the point would be like you, like how is one, how does that ever come back to blame you in some kind of measurable way? It doesn't. And that's how this unwork really functions the best, is that it can be this kind of continual process. So. Work slowly. And I'll give you one example of how to work slowly. Grammar is great, um, right? I mean, this is what nitpicky grammar people do. I'm, I'm, I'm an English major, right? Like, I know. Uh, so what happens is you get this document and you just sort of start squabbling over it. You know what the great thing about grammar squabbling is? You don't actually have to be right, <laughs> right? You're just trying to slow things down. So. Like, and I've watched, again, I've watched this happen. I have been in meetings where what happens is a block of faculty will like raise their hand and there's like three of them so they have power somehow, right? But they will just literally go like, this sentence is not clear to me. Uh, that pronoun is not referring to the, I don't know who it's referring to. And by God, they are just dead wrong, right? It's like nursing faculty. They don't know what the hell they're talking about, right? But it doesn't matter that they're wrong, right? There's three of them and they're saying it and then everybody has to pay attention to that and that takes time. Um, so, um, so right, and again, like the issue here isn't like what you're trying to do is accomplish this thing and have it not really trace back to you in any sort of particularly accountable way, right? That's how to do it. That's one way to do it. So you slow things down. You haggle about things. Um, and uh, and uh, like I'll give you this sort of another example of this, like just the way this works, uh, like because uh, some of these issues touch uh, you know sort of deep bitterness in terms of my own career, like watching it happen, watching my own projects get destroyed. Uh, uh, I was on a curriculum council that uh, the computer science program was trying to push through video game software. Um, I mean, uh, I, I work in Texas, uh, in Beaumont, which, uh, and you know, what's going on in Texas is, oh, well, there's a pretty thriving video game industry. Austin is, is, is uh, fairly large. I, I don't know if you know this, but you probably know it better than I. You know, uh, there's, boy, there's so many opportunities for people who want to do work in gaming. In, in computers, like not just whatever else you would do in computers, but in gaming, it's a booming field, multi-billion dollar industry. But see, we've got faculty who are old school Luddites. They don't even use slides, for God's sake. Uh, it's okay, I, I got you back. No, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, they, like they, you could just tell, right? Like what you had was this block of people who were like, video games, what kind of, that's a bunch of crap, right? <laughs> like what kids need to be learning cursive. I, I, I mean, I wish I were making this up as a joke, right? Like, but that's it, right? They don't want this to happen, but that's not the argument they can make in the committee about the, in the, on the curriculum council, right? Like, so what they did instead was they took the syllabi that were the sample syllabi, right? And they started going the grammar and they were like, well, he calls it a quiz here, but it's a test there. There, right? We need to send it back to them to change this for review. Well, that's, we send it back. 
our committee doesn't meet again for another month, right? That's a month delay. And that's the trick of this. Like, oh, and if we don't get, because if we don't get this into the Texas State Review Board by the January Regents meeting, it won't go this year, right? Like that's, right, what you do is you maximize the bureaucracy that you've got in place. And so they're not going to kill this thing, right? They didn't kill it. But by God, they delayed a year, before we could get those classes in place, that program in place, right? And of course, what they're hoping and what does happen is the computer science chair changes, right? Like the whole thing can just fall apart anyway, um, right? If the, if the stuff doesn't get in place. So, okay, uh, uh, one other sort of bit of this. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that you can do in these committees is uh, it's, it's what the, the book calls sabotage by speech, right? You just sort of start talking in a committee meeting, and particularly depending on who's doing the talking, you can just kind of waste your time. And if the committee meeting's only going to be an hour, right, you bleed it out before anything actually happens. So there's long talkers, tangent talkers, there's ways to stop this. Um, but you just can kind of recognize what's happening when it goes. Um, now, uh, 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 there's like a ton of other different sort of t committee techniques that you, one could use. And so I, I won't sort of run and belabor the project. What I will say, though, is I think what you need to understand is, look, in some sort of real sense, and I'm coming back to the start of the presentation, um, there really is no, like the, ha the defender or hacker paradigm, that sort of binary, it's false, right? Uh, what I don't want to say is there's a bunch of evil people on the committees and then you're the good person trying to change things. Like they, like what you've got with that person who's trying to stop the computer science, they, they, they believed in what they were doing, right? They think that gaming sucks, right? Um, and for them, it's a loss of academic integrity that you would start teaching gaming. And from, right from their perspective, that's it. So they're gonna mobilize every action they can to have that happen. And I just happen to be on the other side of that. The thing to be doing as a social engineer is to sort of recognize those patterns because that's what lets you yourself understand and manipulate them better. Right? Like, so that's the actual goal of all of this. And that's what I think social engineers really do. It's not just that they operate on this kind of personal level of I'm going to do this one thing. It's that they are here, we are here, to look at these bigger pictures and to sort of see where we occupy ourselves in them. And to, if we're going to make some real change, we think about, think about doing it not just on this level of the sort of one thing I do, but of this bigger picture of what do I do in larger groups. Social engineering, right? As uh, Marx says, man is a social being. You're, you're, the, the whole idea is that we're part of this kind of connective community. And if you're thinking about change, don't think about just what you can do at this one moment. Think about, well, think about the classes that you're going to teach that are going to educate hundreds of people or the company that you're working for that is going to do a major thing that will spread its influence elsewhere. Like what are the bigger pictures? And some of those things might take a long time, right? I mean, it took 200 years before everybody really just thinks that you're supposed to be original when you write things and make code, right? It took a long time. Um, but but what you have are people who really made significant changes just by putting the twig in the river at just the right place to divert a flow. Right? And that's what I think is really going on with social engineering period is this sort of bigger picture, which I think we're all aware of, but it's nice to sort of take that step back and see that and see how you can influence it in large committee groups, let's say, right? Um, not just a, a call to one person, but working with, with these sort of blocks. So um, in that sense, then, I, what I would really want to say is, you know, just uh, uh, this is one of those Italian Renaissance things. Uh, uh, people like Machiavelli and De Cecil, there were a whole bunch of these Italian guys who were like, you know, um, we need to start ruling people by soft power, right? Democracy. Uh, democracy, by God, give everybody a voice. Not power, right? But, but uh, you vote. Just vote on something, uh, right? Um, that's, that was a shift, you know, it was monarchy before that, but you get enough people sort of making this argument and you make radical social changes that influence the ways everybody, everybody behaves. That's what social engineering, I think, is about. It's about these sort of real large scale pictures about what do we think we're doing with our technology? What should we be doing with our technology? Um, what should we be doing with all of this and how can we change it for the better? Right is, is is where I would go, and that that uh, it just means you're a hacker or a defender or whatever, right? Like that, like I said, I think that's kind of false binary. The question would be, what are people thinking, and how can we influence what they're thinking? So, thank you. Yeah.